Hey there, stats enthusiast. Welcome back to our AP Statistics series on Unit 3 Collecting Data. We are in the final video of the series, which is going to cover Notes 5, our scope of inference. We're going to start off by talking about the difference between lurking and confounding variables, and then go into exactly what kind of inference conclusions we can draw with our experiments and observational studies we've been talking about. So go ahead and get out your notes and get ready to dive into the content today. Before we get into the scope of inference, which is what this section of notes is going to be about, I want to talk about the difference between lurking and confounding variables. Now, both of these are what's called an extraneous variable, um, and it's a the presence of a variable that is not the explanatory, um, but it does affect the response. And there's two types of extraneous variables present in studies. Um, confounding is most often found in in experiments and lurking is most often found in observational studies. Now those are not um, to say they all that's always the case but that's typically what we see in our obvious examples given in AP statistics. Now in this course um, you don't necessarily have to know um, the difference between lurking and confounding on the AP exam. In fact the AP CED does not mention lurking variables anyway where it does mention confounding um, but I think the distinction is important Important. And if you do use lurking and confounding in your explanations on the AP exam, you do have to know the difference and you don't want to use them um, incorrectly. So let me explain more about the difference between them. Uh, first, a confounding. Um, a confounding variable, again, usually present in an experiment, um, and it's tied to the explanatory in some way, and it will have an effect on the response, but it's difficult to separate the explanatory and the confounding variable. So when we see that response in our experiment, we're like, oh, was that caused by the explanatory or the confounding variable? Um, here's an example of what this looks like, okay? So if we want to test um, the fertilizer in our garden um, to see if the type of fertilizer makes a difference in the number of peppers we grow, we can do an experiment where half of our garden is filled with the old fertilizer and the other half of the garden is filled with the new fertilizer. And we'll plant the same amount of pepper plants in each fertilizer and then see how many peppers grow at the end of the experiment. Now, one thing to note about your garden too, is that half of your garden gets full sun um, all day while the other half gets shade most of the day. So we have sun and no sun. And the way I have my experiment set up, if this box is my entire garden, um, this side gets no sun, this side gets shade, and this side gets full sun. And I set it up so that my new fertilizer my peppers are planted in the new fertilizer in full sun and the old fertilizer in no sun, okay? So at the end of the experiment, what I see is the side with the new fertilizer grew the most peppers. Um, so can I say then that, hey, hey, the new fertilizer is better. I have more peppers in the new fertilizer. Um, well, we can't tell if it was the new fertilizer that caused that or if the sun played a role. The sun would be our confounding variable here. Now, you look at this situation and you might be like, well, this is a little silly. Why would you set up an experiment like this? Um, and in some cases, that's true. Uh, what's nice about experiments is that we can control for a lot of situations um, and any confounding variables that we might be able to think of, like the sun, we can control for. So how can we fix this in our experimental design? Well, we can block by sun location, okay? So we can say, okay, if this is, again, my garden, instead of doing half and half um, horizontally, I can do half and half vertically so that I have the old fertilizer with no sun and the new fertilizer with no sun and the old fertilizer with sun, new fertilizer with sun. <laughs> so you see, I, I've accounted for all situation, situations. I've controlled my confounding variable. And that's what experiments are going to really be about. Um, many confounding variables can be controlled um, sometimes through blocking and sometimes through just smart experimental designs. Um, not all can be though, and there are some times where we might not anticipate a confounding variable, but it does come up in our study. So be on the lookout for it. 
Okay. So confounding variables. So um, the big difference between confounding and lurking is that confounding in this case was the sun and the sun and the fertilizer weren't related in any way. The sun and the fertilizer did have an impact on the response together, but the sun and the fertilizer themselves, the sun um, and the fertilizer aren't again, related, right? They're not, um, the sun isn't impacting the fertilizer that we know of, right? I'm, I guess I'm not a biologist. I don't know for sure. But in this case, the sun and the fertilizer were not, um, were not influencing one another. And another difference, we can control the sun and we can block for it um, versus a lurking variable. Sometimes other textbooks call this a common response. Um, we call it a lurking variable here. It's um, usually present in an observational study and it's present in a way that is driving each of the two variables that are under investigation. Um, so we've talked about lurking when we did um, a linear regression because a lurking variable is a lot of the times the reason why we can't um, say that correlation equals causation. Um, that would be incorrect to say and usually it's because of a lurking variable here. Um, the lurking variable makes there appear um, makes it appear that there's some association between the explanatory and response when in reality there isn't. Okay, so the lurking drives both of them in some way and sort of lurks in the background and makes it seem like there's a relationship when there's not. And here's, um, here's sort of a situation here. So data was observed, gathered, examined on the amount of damage from a fire in dollar amounts and the number of firefighters that actually responded to the fire. A researcher concluded that the more firefighters responded to the fire, um, the more damage, and more damage means, you know, the more money that was lost in a fire. So they suggested that um, the least number of firefighters should respond to a fire in order to keep costs down, right? So think about that. More firefighters um, caused more damage in terms of um, in terms of the fire, right? So there is this associ this um, correlation between them. Okay, can't deny there's a correlation between them. But why is this kind of a silly? Um, assumption or a silly conclusion to draw. Um, well, there's a lurking variable at play, right? And that's going to be the size of the fire. The size of the fire, the bigger the fire, the more firefighters are going to respond and the more money in terms of damage you're going to see. Um, so the lurking variable at play is the size of a fire. Okay, so that's what we have to look out for in our observational studies. Now let's get into our scope of inference. And we touched on this a little bit, but I really wanna bring it full circle in this section of notes here. When we're talking about inference, we're talking about being able to draw conclusions beyond what the data tells us. So beyond our observational study, beyond our experiment, we do these in order to draw some conclusion, in order to make an inference. Um, so what are we allowed to do, okay? We're gonna look at, take a look at two different uh, studies here. So in this example, the U.S. Census Bureau carries out a monthly population survey of 60,000 randomly selected homes in the United States, and that's how they actually come up with the national unemployment rate is from those randomly selected house, houses. So this example, this is an observational study because they randomly select in order to gather the individuals, um, and then they observe the data that's at hand. Now, because this example uses random selection, they can use this data to make inferences about the larger population. So that's what you see. They, they take a sample, and then they say, hey, the, un the national unemployment rate is this percentage, right? Now, they don't know that for sure, because there's so many people, you know, and they don't conduct a census every month. So they randomly select, and through that random selection, through that sample, they make an inference about the larger population. A second example might be if researchers wanted to see if sleep deprivation caused a decrease in mental performance. They gathered 20 volunteers, randomly assigned half to a sleep deprivation cycle and half to a regular sleep cycle. After two sleep cycles, they examined how quickly they were able to complete a maze. Now, in this case, we had 20 volunteers, so we did not randomly select but we random ass randomly assigned. And when we randomly assign treatments, individuals to treatments, um, we 
look at the response and if there's a quote unquote large enough difference between the responses of the two groups, we can make inferences about cause and effect relationship between the explanatory and response variable. Okay. Now that quote unquote large enough difference, okay, how um, different does it have to be to be significant and to imply a cause and effect relationship? We will get into that in our inference units and we'll tell we will talk about exactly what that large enough difference has to be so that is coming up for right now random assignment um, you can infer a cause and effect relationship between the explanatory and response okay so well-designed experiments randomly assign individuals to treatment groups but remember they don't usually select from the larger population. So findings are just really limited to cause and effect and not necessarily to a larger population, okay? So I have this little table to try to help summarize this, okay? Because there's really two big things we're looking at. Were individuals randomly assigned to groups, to treatment groups, or were the individuals randomly selected? Okay. Now, if you have both of these things, okay, if the individuals were randomly assigned to groups and they were randomly selected, you can make inferences about the population as a whole, and you can make inferences about cause and effect. Now, remember, this is, while this sounds nice, this is not usually what we see in practice because for individuals to um, be randomly assigned to groups, to treatment groups, we have to run an experiment, um, and an experiment lets us do the cause and effect, but we need volunteers, okay? We just can't randomly select people from the population and tell them, hey, you're gonna be in this experiment. That's um, unethical to do. So we don't usually see this situation, okay? Um, the situations we do see, um, when we can make inferences about the population and inferences about cause and effect. Um, inferences about the population, yes, if they were randomly selected. Okay, so were the individuals randomly selected? Yes, then yes, we can make inferences about the population. Were the individuals randomly assigned to groups? If the answer is no, then we cannot make cause and effect um, observations. So this box is usually our observational studies. Okay our surveys, our sample surveys, where we individually, we randomly select them, but we don't assign to groups, we just observe the data, okay? So that's observational studies where this usually falls, okay? The other box where this usually, usually falls, um, were the individuals randomly assigned to groups? Yes, if that's the case, then we can make inference about cause and effect. Um, and were individuals randomly selected? No, then no, we cannot make inference about the population. And this is where your experiments usually hang out. Okay. Because we don't usually randomly select for experiments, but we do randomly assign to treatment groups. Okay. And of course, just for completion's sake, the last box, um, if we don't randomly assign or we don't randomly select, then we can't make any inferences. Okay? We have to have um, this idea of random assignment or random selection in order to draw inferences. Otherwise, we know we're going to introduce bias or um, confounding variables into our situations, and we just can't make accurate uh, conclusions from that. Okay. Which brings up our last point in this section of notes here. Um, and it's some of the um, challenges of drawing causation, okay? So in a lot of cases, it's not practical or even ethical to do an experiment to establish that cause and effect relationship. We can't set up an experiment um, in some situations uh, in order to determine um, a cause and effect relationship. And we touched on a couple of these in our first section of notes, um, but let's look at these examples. If I wanted to answer the question, does texting while driving increase the risk of having an accident? Think about how a cause, so that's a cause and effect, right? Does texting um, increase the risk of an accident? So explanatory response, we want to draw a cause and effect relationship. Is there an ethical way to set up that experiment? Can I say, okay, I'm randomly assigning people to one group who are gonna text while drive driving and we're gonna see if they get in an accident? And the other people are gonna be randomly assigned to a group and we're gonna see if um, 
if they don't text, will they not get in an accident, <laughs> right? Um, it's unethical to set up that experiment. Now, you could make the argument we could do like um, um, like a video game simulation. Uh, that would be a way to do this nowadays. But to actually get true results, we can't just put them out on the road and say text while drive and don't text while drive. Same thing with like go just going to church, help people live longer. We can't assign people to say, okay, you guys go to church, but you guys don't go to church and we'll see who lives longer, okay? Same thing with smoking, causing lung cancer. This group, you're gonna smoke. This group, you're not gonna smoke and we're just gonna see how this lung cancer thing plays out. No, okay, right? All of these, it would be difficult to set up an experiment, nay, impossible, I dare say. Um, so some situations... Um, like this, the way we answer the cause and effect questions is from long-term observational studies, uh, where we have a lot of studies that we examine, and um, that's called a meta-analysis, by the way. If you see that term meta-analysis um, in the news, that means a meta-analysis means that you looked at a bunch of different studies and you're drawing a conclusion from all of those studies, right? And that's really how we've been able to say like, yes, smoking for sure causes lung cancer. We haven't done an experiment on it, but we've looked at so many studies and so much data from observational studies that we can confirm that cause and effect relationship, okay? So to summarize too, with ethics, we have to make sure that we are treating our human subjects and even our animal subjects with respect and dignity. So we have laws in place now that must be followed in order to run that ethical experiment. Um, so some of the big ones are, um, all, all experiments are reviewed by a review board um, whose purpose is to, they say, protect the rights and welfare of human subjects who are recruited to participate in research activities. So you do have a board that reviews your experiment in order to make sure that it follows all of the, you know, taking care of human subjects um, correctly, right? Um, one of the big things that they make sure is that the subjects have informed consent, that they know what harm or danger they could, the study could inflict, and they have to give written permission in order to participate. Part of this informed consent, consent is also that subjects have the ability to withdraw from the experiment at any time. Um, if at any point they're not doing good uh, mentally, physically, or they just don't want to anymore, subjects can withdraw from the experiment um, with no, no punishment at all. And the other big thing is confidentiality. When we run an experiment, we have to protect individuals' privacy. And usually that involves keeping their um, true information separate from their results. And the review board makes sure um, that they do that too. So among other things, those are a couple of the ways that we make sure experiments are ethically enforced um, when, they are, when they are created. And that wraps up today's lesson on notes five, scope of inference, and also wraps up our entire series of unit three collecting data. Thank you guys so much for following along today. If you have liked this video, please go ahead and click the like button or subscribe to my YouTube channel for more AP statistics content coming your way. Um, but until then, I wish you endless statistical success and I will see you in the next video.